All right, so just kicked off this contest earlier today. It's Friday night, 8.20 p.m. And I'm pretty inspired by this person's request right here. Jackie Robinson asked, how about a bug challenge that must be completed within 24 hours? For example, go on a scouting trip, find a suitable insect candidate, Share all information known about that insect's life cycle. Create a proper enclosure for that insect. Share information about how to keep insects as a pet and how that compares to its life in the wild. And so I'm going to just pop on down the street here and go for a walk and see what I can scout out and find. Complete those first two steps. See if I can put this video together. You never know until you try. All right, here we are, out looking for something. Well, now that didn't take long. Got two spiders right here, two heckle mesh weavers. Get a nice close look there. That one, that would be a tempting one to take back, but you may have seen that I've made videos about them already. And then this here, interesting, something has been collecting fern leaves, fronds, an animal of some kind in there, nesting, some moss that it has also brought in. And what really caught my eye there, I suppose, was the sow bug there on the leaf. Also not really grabbing me in terms of something to take back because, well, I do need to make a video on isopods, but there are lots of videos like that already out there. And so we're going to look for something a little different. I would choose the spider over that. And just kind of looking around, see what else there is to see. It's the tail end of January. Right there we have a Terastichus ground beetle. It's a warm night, and that's part of the reason why I chose to make this particular video. I felt like I could actually do some justice to it. And these ground beetles, are predatory or scavengers. I thought maybe it's possible that it's feeding on the remains of a slug there. I'm not entirely sure. Let's keep walking. And so here at the very bottom of that burrow there's probably a trapdoor spider in there but it's too far back in for me to easily extract it without tearing the whole place up, which I don't want to do. A slightly larger ground beetle just hit itself in here. Let's take a closer look at it. Oh, it's a, it's a pair of them. There's a male there, and I believe this is a female based on how thick her abdomen looked there. Well, hard to focus sometimes. Wouldn't normally see ground beetles out here, but it's an unseasonably warm night. And over here, we saw a sow bug a few moments ago. We see two species of them right here. This one here is Oniscus ocellus. And right over there, Porcelio scaber. Quite a few more of the scaber over here, all over this log, really. Lots and lots of them pop 
been here for some close-ups. You can see the rough texture there on its carapace. That one just kind of flipped itself over. Oh, so not seeing anything too out of the ordinary or interesting here yet. Let's keep walking. Sometimes we'll see some harvestmen hanging out here on the night shift. These sides of trees here in the moss. I do see a spider web there. A sheet web spider of some kind or another. Right there. See it moving? Kind of pale for a sheet web. I don't know if you guys will be able to see any of these, but, oh, there goes one. The night crawlers are out feeding on the leaves. And if I can sneak up on one, we can get a look at it. There's one right there, just barely out still. And as I get a little closer, you'll see it move back in. There it goes, tucking themselves back in. Oop. Well, what do we have here? Oh, a little flea beetle. Altica is the genus for these. They are metallic blue. And let's see if we can demonstrate without losing it why they are called flea beetles. And by losing, I mean before it performs. <laughs> and there I just dropped it. Well, it's a little chilly here, but they do have these thicker back legs that enable to them enable them to jump rather well in warmer conditions. This one's moving a little slow on account both of the temperature out here, probably around 50 degrees right now, and also it's a bit wet. But given the time of year, we're doing pretty good here. Let's see here. Ah, there's a sheet web spider. A little bit more characteristic in terms of coloration. And you can tell rather easily that this one is a male on account of what I can't seem to get back into focus. Those palpal bulbs up front. Really hard to see from this angle. But there are two swollen balls, or they look like boxing gloves sort of there on the right side. That indicates that it's a male. A springtail. here. 
park is open until 10 p.m. Well, shoot, I got a few more minutes still. Wonderful. I thought I was trespassing or something. Well, that's funny. I was going to take a picture of something that was on this post right here. And fortunately, it jumped there on my hand instead. Let's take it in a little closer. Where are you? A globular springtail, the one we saw before on the sign here was an, well, a slender springtail. I'm always tempted to call them elongate springtails. And a small slug. Not enough legs, if you ask me. Sometimes around these trash cans we can see carrion beetles. Not Today. And here are a few fun finds. Got this spotted leopard slug there. Seems to have some globular springtails hanging out with it. And then we have the snail over here doing yoga. Quite impressive. I've long, long wondered what species of snail that is. And another here. See the eye stalk on the right retracting. That would be the slug's right. And what else is hanging around here? You can see some sow bugs tucked in there. And this is just not a uh, not an insect, but some shelf fungus here. It's quite interesting looking if I can get the light right on it. A black light there. No, it doesn't really show in the black light. Oh, there we go. I've got a light on the camera here too and so but look at that fluorescing purple. Very pretty. else noteworthy on this stump. This would be the windy side here. Another slug. Well, so far, well, this is interesting. We are at the park, and uh, it's definitely not strawberry season. But an opportunity here for a ground beetle. Have a little out of season snack. Perhaps this Oniscus isopod will make its way down there for a bite as well. You know, we've seen a lot, but no doubt we've walked by more than we have noticed. Lots more. Oh, well, here we go, Tylobolus unsigurus, adorned in winter mites, much in fashion here in the early winter months of 2020. That would be a good candidate for collecting, taking back, and doing a video of, but Here's something else to share with you. 
may enjoy. Now there are some interesting little cups there, mushrooms. Um, I think they call them bird's nests, bird's nest fungus. Kind of an unexpected little treat there. But what I was trying to show you instead, very carefully here, is this wily escape artist of a salamander. And you can just begin to see its orange tail there. get you a decent look at this one. I'm going to give it a little... Well, I don't want to poke it. Someone's going to get mad at me if I do that. So, we will just look at it and then find another, undoubtedly, as we walk along. Go something flying. Let's see what that is. That is a brown lace wing. Oh, there it is. You're probably more familiar with the green lace wings, lacy winged insects that you see at your porch lights. These are a little bit smaller, brown lace wings. Hemerobiidae, slightly different family than the Chrysopidae green lacewings. And like many Neuropterans, the order Neuroptera, their eyes reflect light. And a few tiny slugs. <laughs> Just about squished that one because I was sort of falling over here in my squat position. Another slug, another slug, small slugs, more slugs, another snail. This is the Oregon side-banded snail. They actually do get considerably larger than this. Give me a little high five there. Probably won't be too much to see right over here, so we'll walk on in a different direction. Another Tylobolus. I think I'm going to collect this one. Well, interestingly, here is a smaller one. To, oh, and there's one of the salamanders. I said that we would get a better look at. Very, very pretty. And decent sized. So I'm going to gather up these two millipedes. This one here and this one here. I'm going to put in a little bit of bark and moss and stuff for them to cling on to for the ride home. Not 100% committed to making this the species that we set up for the care video, but not the greatest time of year for options, and so I don't want to leave empty-handed. There, that one's quite pretty. Let's see, a little 
point there, I think, on its eye. quite make out what that bug is, though. It's so unbelievably small. We'll zoom in just a little bit here, but the camera shake's going to get kind of bad. I apologize. See just how small this scene is. And... Oh, well, that's actually a pretty exciting find for me right there. A stonefly here. Rather colorful species. The back side of that ledge, and then over here, what might be a winter crane fly. Mm, antennae are too long. Some kind of weird fly in a family that I do not quite recall. And Back here, a Pamoa spider, one of our more common winter spiders in the area. Sorry about that. Size reference. Lots to see. What is this here? I thought maybe it was a pirate spider, but I don't know. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess pirate spider on that one. Not sure though. Ah, well now this is very interesting. And the color of that web, it's actually, I did not think it was going to show up here in the camera lens. Um, this is actually the very best example I have ever seen of a triangle web spider web. Um, that's really amazing. It reminds me of the ZZ Top symbol there a little bit. So this is a triangle web spider. Eulobolidae, maybe the family? Something like that. And uh, let's see if we can get zoomed in there on the spider. It's going to be tricky because of that it's suspended in the air. It's always hard to get something in focus. Um, there's something called a feather leg spider that somebody was asking me to make a video about a few weeks ago, and I said that I couldn't make a video of that because they're not native to the United States, but they do hold their body position in this same way, and they are in the same family of spiders. Wow. I actually can't get over the blue coloration of this web. I mean, it's in my hand here. That web is noticeably blue. It looks a little thicker on the camera than it does to my eyes, but quite nice. And I'm happy to announce that this unseasonably warm weather is resulting in the early leafing out of some things. A very small spider here. Lots more Pomoa spiders down here. Sort of always like the mushroom shots. Can't pass 
up on a mushroom. Another thing that you'll see out here in the winter this time of year are these fireflies. And this one here is in the genus Elichnia. Probably not saying that correctly, but we call them diurnal fireflies, which are different than the nocturnal fireflies in the east. And these ones lack the light producing bioluminescent organs. But those two red stripes are likely an indicator that it is poisonous. And it's really a very attractive beetle. A very nice find. Hmm. You know, I think for me that one is more interesting than the millipede. So I'm going to collect that into the cup here with a little bit of moss for it to hold on to. And that is now our front runner in terms of what I might make a care video for. I have never attempted to keep one before, which means I will actually have to fulfill the other portions of the request because I don't know how to care for them. A little bit of lichen growing there. Kind of an interesting spot to see it growing. I read recently that it has recently been determined that lichen, instead of consisting of a symbiosis between two organisms is actually a symbiosis in at least some cases of three organisms. And that revelation has answered some long held questions about why lichens are so mysterious. Pretty things. The moss. And lots of lichen here. Different kinds, or maybe just one of the organisms a little better off than the others. Epiphytic mosses grow on the trees here. Very neat to look at. And here, the water getting louder. A little bit of a falls here next to us. Turn my black light bulb on there, the flashlight. See these beautiful colors.
tissue moth. Geometer moth, one kind or another. The word rill comes to mind, R-I-L-L. -L. A little trickle of water. And I just like seeing the ferns, the mushrooms, growing around. Pretty good sized fern there. scavenger beetle. I think that's what it is. And another. Where are you? Oops. I just bumped something and caused a disturbance there in the water. You know, this would be a very seasonal runoff of water. It's not actively raining here at the moment, but to see a little water beetle cruising down that temporary rill, it's pretty neat. little tiny things just out here living out their lives making a life for themselves oh now I just saw in this hole right here it's unlikely that you guys will be able to see it but there is a tiger beetle larva in that hole and if I get the angle just right you can see its head capsule Well, that would be a very, very neat thing to extract and take back. And of course, this comes right on the heels of what I was just saying about all of these wonderful things living their lives out here. There's another kind of salamander right there. Darker. But I have always been fascinated and there's nothing more interesting to me than having all of this to myself here. Long after everybody else went to bed, I should come out here and explore. I have it all to myself. And I do enjoy seeing these things out here in the wild and taking a few back to make additional observations in a tank. There are things that you would see in the tank that you wouldn't be able to see out here in the wild. And just look at all of this. this. This is nature. So much going on. Not just the bugs. The mosses. And the lichens. All of this on the side of a Douglas fir tree. And 
just habitat after habitat here. The folds in the bark. Another spider right there. Making a living. Actually, I think that was a piece of bark, but the spider was back in there somewhere. And this particular kind of moss, the name of it is escaping me at the moment. For some reason, the word sword or military or soldier, maybe that's it. Um, oh, well, there's one right there. It will get a little red sort of fluorescence on it. Right there. And you come here at the right time, all of these little things will have those red tips. There's some more right there. Just like flowers in a way. And I think that's an Enoplognatha spider in the uh, same family as black widows and false widows. Comb-footed spiders. Quite pretty, often even more yellow than that specimen. That one was probably about half grown. Ah, an interesting smell in the air. Someone asked about Bigfoot the other day. It was a good smell, not a bad smell. Neat to see ferns growing up the side of this tree. Split there in the wood. Another snail. And a very winter coloration of the Colobius severus there, or perhaps one that was freshly molted. A little drop of sap. And look at the red on her. Gotta say, that's a beautiful spider. And nice sized too. Interesting little collection of sticks there. Just looking around, not looking for anything in particular, just the smallest sign of movement. Another one just peeking out. Waiting for something to crawl past. Can hear a frog croaking in the distance. Pretty nice piece of lichen there. Surprised to see leaves there on that plant. Well, it's very nice to be out here. First time 
I've come down here in a few months and I really appreciate this person's request. Get out here and to see these signs of spring. It's very encouraging. The air is very fresh. It's been raining a lot lately. And the bugs are not disappointing us tonight. We're doing just fine here. Another one of the Pacific sideband snails. We won't boop this one. Mesh weaver Colobius severus again. Quite a few species here that we see regularly. I haven't seen anything yet except that stonefly that surprised me. And even that, truthfully, I've been watching for them the last few days in my yard, thinking that maybe a winter stone fly would make an appearance. at tiger beetle heads again, hoping that you guys might be able to see one. But they retract into their burrows at the first hint of light, and that of course makes it very difficult to show them to you. But Hello there. Didn't see you. Sometimes we see ones with yellow on them here too. A few months ago somebody had told me what species that is. Western red-backed salamander. I think that's what it was. Lots of night crawlers retracting to their burrows as we make our way downhill. And the geometer moths flying, attracted to the light. <laughs> Where did you go?
pretty interesting. And then over here, I wish I had a person who knew something about fungi here. That's quite an interesting specimen right there. The molds, maybe a slime mold. I'm not really sure, but I am very interested in all of these things, even though they aren't typically the focus of what gets me outside, but I like to see it all. Nice stand of that particular one. And then down here, kind of shelf fungus. Looks like it's being ravaged by something. There are a few beetles that we might encounter on fungus. And another salamander hiding there in the shot next to this, I think it's shelf fungus. I don't know if there are multiple kinds of fungus that look shelf-like, and if only one is called shelf fungus, but Maybe somebody will educate us all about that. I have to be careful to pay attention to where I'm going. Not easy enough to trip. All right, this is a very, oh, <laughs> oh. There was a salamander poking its head out of a hole there, and it retracted its head back into the hole in the cutest way. Oh, and there's a tiny little one right there. So tiny. Oh, interesting. There's one of the yellowish ones I was telling you about. Nose to nose with a reddish one. Now, I would have guessed those were two separate species. Somebody out there, help us out. Everything on the ground starts to look like a salamander at some point. Every stick and leaf and makes me worry. So dog hair there. This right here is one of my favorite little spots on this particular walk. We may not see anything this time due to the season, but this is a time or a place where I often find something interesting. This is a lot of busted up wood right here. Kind of curious about something off there in the distance. Oh, there goes a salamander. But what is that? I can't even get too close to it. Well, there's another one right there. Some weird kind of fungus. And another back there. Puffballs, perhaps? I suppose. For the sake of science, we must give this a little poke. There you go. I think those are puffballs. Yeah, 
Let's see if we can get back down here without entertaining everybody with a fall. <laughs> Don't want to go down there. Check the water here for a moment. It's quite high. So it's moving more quickly too. Ah, I believe we have a stonefly larva there. Peeking out from underneath the rock. And uh, that's something that I would actually like to try to keep alive. if I am able to catch it. One of my techniques for catching it is pushing this into the water fast so that a little bit of suction is created right next to the animal. Let's see how we do. <laughs> well, one of my improvements on that is going to be to move that rock. Let's try this again. Fortunately, it didn't swim away. And... <laughs> Again, it did not swim away. So, it's uh, cooperating with us here. I expected it to be much quicker, but it looks like uh, it's not going to be getting away from me on account of speed. Often water bugs will swim very quickly away. And and there it is. Well, we'll take some closer shots of this one. Back at the house. Again, we're going to pick a little bit of this weed right here. Just so that it has a little something to hold on to. And... Pretty sure that was a... Sometimes I get distracted by rocks, sorry. <laughs> Um, pretty sure that was a stonefly larva, but we shall look that up when we get back. What is this here? I don't know if you guys had seen it, but there was a water strider at first. So I think that's about it for now going to walk back and see you guys again in a little while. All right, what I'm going to do here is walk you guys through how I find information about caring for the various insects that I might find out in the wild and then bring in. Now, of course, it would be ideal to do the research before you bring the animal in. I suppose to set up the container for it so that everything is ready from the moment that you bring it in. But uh, this is a contest and I was asked to do things a different way and we don't always know. We might find something really cool that we get excited about that we weren't expecting to find. Uh, it could happen with a jumping spider, for example. Everybody seems to love jumping spiders right now. And to be seeing them across social media platforms, and then all of a the sudden they find one outdoors, and in the back of their mind they sort of always wanted one, but they weren't going to necessarily go through the process of ordering one online, like from bugsandcyberspace.com, for example. And so then they find it and then they're like, oh, now, now I need to know how to care for it. They may have been sort of peripherally paying attention to how people were keeping them when they saw them in videos, but never really went through the motions of figuring out or researching what the proper care is. And so you need to then do the research and we're going to go through that a little bit here. Fortunately, with most of the pet bugs people keep, there are generally lots of care sheets online or um, at least other people who have had experiences, maybe have videos up 
maybe they don't necessarily explain how to keep things, but you can use the videos or pictures as a frame of reference for how to keep things. Or you may find a spider outside and not be able to figure out exactly what species it is, but you can find something that's similar looking. And then through researching, uh, you may not find that species, a care sheet for it, but you can maybe um, approximate care for it or uh, guess as to what the care might be based on other sort of similar things you find online. And so we're now going to just go through my process here. I'm going to move the camera just slightly so that you can see how I search these things and we're gonna really take it in here a little bit so that you can watch this. Now, the organism I chose is the Elichnia. Let's see if I bumped that camera in the wrong way. Um, the diurnal firefly. And so really, I'm going to just start with the most basic search here, Elichnia. And you can see that I've already looked them up on Bug Guide at one time or another. This brought me to the distribution page of Bug Guide. Bug Guide is always a great place to um, learn about not just the taxonomy, the basically what is this that I found kind of thing. Helps to have a little bit of a frame of reference for, you know, I brought this firefly in. And so, you know, for me personally, I know that fireflies are beetles. And so I would pop into this right here. You could hit this taxonomy tab up here. And if you have a little bit of familiarity with how beetles are broken down, within these suborders here. It was the order Coleoptera, these suborders here. You would then be able to do it that way. Or if you don't have familiarity with taxonomy, you might come through this browse tab up here, which is different than the images tab, which will take you to species. In the browse tab here, they're going to break things down in a more, well, in the images tab, they're still gonna break it down similar, similarly, but you're gonna to have to scroll through I can't even tell you how many pages. So at least on this Browse tab, you could see um, these right here, these suborders. You click through them. These are the ground beetles right here and water beetles. And so you would just kind of click through these things and see where your beetle might be. And there's only two pages here for this suborder. Anyway, it's really hard to explain, um, and this isn't really the point of what I'm showing you anyway. I'm just giving you a quick little look here about how we get to where we need to go on Bug Guide. So I'm going to pop back here to this order page where it lists the suborders. I'm going to click in here to this section right here. And just because I've got a, a fairly decent familiarity with taxonomy, I know that within this suborder polyphaga, water rove, scarab, longhorned leaf, and snout beetles, we're going to see these Aladariformia. Um, and we're going to click within that. Now, I, I could have gone directly to the firefly page, the super family Aladaroidea, click firefly and soldier beetles. But I'm kind of taking you the long way here because it might be a little bit more informative. And we all have different amounts of knowledge about how all of this works. And so I'm giving some of you and perhaps the majority of you a little bit more information even than what you probably want to sink your teeth into at this point. So we're now on the super family page here. That's a taxonomic category. Um, in between the order and the family, there's a super family category that people don't even really discuss that much, even among entomologists. But um, I don't see it on this page here, the fireflies in particular, so I'm going to click down here to the second page, and here's the firefly section, the lampyrids, or the family lampyridae. And so, lampyridae, I mean, I can already see the picture of... Um, Alichnia here, one of the species of Alichnia, but I was going to give you a little overview here. We're now in the family Lampyridae, the fireflies, and it shows that in our area here there are four genera, one, two, three, four, five genera, or genuses, some people will use that word, of fireflies here in the United States. That's one of my photos right there, here on Bug Guide, for the genus Terotus. 
Um, but the one that we're looking for is up here in uh, the Lampyrini. And then we're gonna scroll down the page here to this tribe right here. I can see our beetle right here. And then we have five species or five, five genera. One, two, three, four, five. And then on the second page, there's one more. So a total of six here under this tribe, Lucidotini. And the diurnal fireflies are right here. And now that we're in this um, species page, we've got one, two, three, four, five. And it shows that there are six, seven, eight. There are eight species. We could also pop back here to the diurnal fireflies and go to this info tab and scroll down. And this is where we're gonna find some information here on for the genus Elichnia. We're gonna find some information about this organism um, and specific information. And it will tell us here that some of the other common names aside from diurnal fireflies are the day flying firefly and the winter firefly. I like the name winter firefly because now it is February 1st, uh, the day after we found it last night when I made the other part of this video. And it's sort of winter time now, but uh, diurnal firefly is just what I've always been familiar with them as. And it says there are several, several species from the southwestern US and the Pacific coast, which is where we are. It doesn't say how many there are, but I, oh, here it is, numbers, 12 species in our area. And it says it needs revision, so these haven't been studied to um, the satisfaction of whoever made this page. So it says the size here, it gives a little bit of information on what the name means. It's Greek for lamp wick. Lichnos means lamp. And habitat, active during the day. I have seen them flying during the day. Common on tree trunks in the spring, on goldenrod and asters in autumn, or on flowers and grassy vegetation, especially in moist habitats. And so it gives some information about what they are found on. But this page here, and sometimes the author of this page or the person who created this page, they don't exactly know um, what all of, they can't fill in all of these fields, all these bold fields are standardized across bug guide. And so, but we can begin to maybe guess what kind of foods these eat by the plants they're found on. And so it says tree trunks in the spring. Um, I see them on tree trunks and other things at night on goldenrod and asters in the autumn, which suggests that maybe they feed on pollen or nectar. And so that might, if we can't find any other information as we do our searching here, that might be our fallback plan in case we can't find any other information. It also says on flowers and grassy vegetation, especially in moist habitats. And that may be key also to determining whether we keep them in a dry habitat or better in a moist habitat. And it looks like that is all the information they're going to provide to us here. One other interesting thing we can do here on the data tab is scroll down here. I live in Oregon and because I'm logged in on Bug Guide up here in the corner, log in and it shows this is this is my page on Bug Guide here. Um, I don't know if it says when I joined Bug Guide, but I've been on here for a while. Uh, let's see here. And it says I've contributed 291 images to the guide, which really isn't that impressive. If I had nothing else to do all day long, I would just do it continuously because I really enjoy it. And for me, it's the best way to learn about what things are at least traditionally. But uh, click on Oregon here, my state, and I'm gonna look down here on the side here and I see that they haven't listed any of these beyond the genus level, which means that it's very difficult to distinguish between species within this genus. And of course, genus and species, um, I'll pop back here for a moment so you can see what I'm talking about here. 
um, Elichnia californica. The genus is Elichnia, capitalized Californica. The California glowworm, Elichnia corusca. Elichnia facula flavicolis, green eye. And there's another one on the next page. None of the ones in Oregon, according to the data tab that we just looked at, have been categorized to the level of species. And so we don't know what species this is. We could probably take a guess if we really poked around the guide a lot more, looked at this data tab, looked at neighboring states to see which ones were. Um, this one here in California is Elichnia californica. Scrolling down here to see if they have, there's one, another one there called Magista. So we might be able to figure it out, but there's almost not really any point because uh, nobody watching this is probably going to be able to tell me what species it is and nobody is probably really going to care. We just want to know how to take care of that. That's the point of this video and this study <laughs> we are doing here. It would be wonderful to know what the species is, but that's a little bit out of the scope of what we're doing here. So I think we have found all of the information that we can, we can on the genus page. I'm going to pop in here to this Californica page because there are a lot of images for this one here. You can see that that's a pretty good number of images. I'm going to pop in here and just double check to see if maybe they mentioned anything about what this species eats because we're, we're uh, grasping at straws now. We really want to see if we can find anything else here on Bug Guide that's going to help us. And it only says here that flowers and grassy vegetation, which they probably just simply duplicated from the other page. I'm gonna check one other one here, just out of curiosity. Can be a pest in sap buckets in the spring. Ah, so this species here, Elichnia carusca, can be a pest in sap buckets. I don't even really know what a sap bu bucket is, uh, but it sounds like it's a collection bucket for sap, maybe like syrup or something. I don't really know what that means, why someone would put a bucket under sap. However, it lends itself again to um, its information that we can use maybe to feed this. And so at this point, I'm thinking that the little jelly cups that I feed to lots of other beetles and pet bugs will be a fantastic thing to try with these to sustain it. Um, I do believe that these fireflies either emerge in the winter, I've seen them in the spring, I've also seen them late in the fall, and the information here it says February to December overwinters as an adult. So their season is February, which is about now, through to December, and somewhere in there more will emerge as fresh adults, and then overwinter as adults. So that gives us a key detail about the life cycle there too. And so we also know that mine is likely an overwintering adult. It may be that there wasn't anything for it to feed on this time of year. And so it's going through sort of a dormant stage, even though they're out and about. And especially on warm, sunny days, they probably become active just a little bit. I'm just doing all of this on the basis of experience, personal observation, and these little bits of information that I'm reading here. I'm gonna pop, pop over now to Wikipedia, and I'm gonna type in Elichnia here, see what we come up with. A genus of fireflies, adults are this color, no light producing organs, active during the day, they use uh, chemical signals to attract mates. The larvae are found living in rotting logs. And so this isn't a larva that we're trying to keep. Um, and I do believe the larvae of at least some fireflies are predatory. So Wikipedia isn't giving us very much here either. I'm going to pop up here to this page here for the subfamily Lampyrini. See if it's going to offer us any information here about what they eat, and it does not appear to. I'm going to pop up one more page here to the family page, Lampyridae, and that is a very broad thing that will include the category of all fireflies in the family, which it says here there are 2,000 described species, 
and I'm going to, because they will likely have some life cycle information here, some feeding information about them, I'm going to scour this here. And I'm gonna type in something here to save us some time. The word flowers didn't come up. Let's see if nectar comes up, there it is. Some, well, let's back up here. The larvae of most species are specialized predators and feed on other larvae, terrestrial snails, and slugs. Some are so specialized that they have grooved mandibles that deliver digestive fluids directly to their prey. And then it goes on to say, um, the adult diet varies, some are predatory, and so I might also, just for the sake of um, testing or hypothesis, add in a little bit of protein-based food in the form of a, another insect or a protein pellet like uh, fish food pellets. It says also that others feed on plant pollen or nectar. Some, like the European glowworm beetle, have no mouth. And so that gives us a little bit more information. I'm feeling pretty confident at this point that I have gathered enough information also in combination with my experience with other things to uh, go set up a tank for them. And so that's what I'm going to do here in the next video segment. Thank you. So I just grabbed this container, this lid right here, put some coconut fiber in there. Now I'm going to pick up some bits of moss and other things from out here. There's a cool looking piece of something. Some lichens, put that in there. If the lichens do well, it means I have the humidity right. See what else we can find around here. I know another place over on the other side of the house that I can find some moss. Actually, here's a pretty good little stand of it here. I'm going to break this little branch here. Easier said than done. Actually, there's a piece of moss right there that's available. Nice piece of that. I'm going to put that in there. And go upstairs and show you these uh, springtails here real quick first, but we'll go get our beetle. Ooh, speaking of beetles, check this guy out right here. This is one of our winter longhorns here in Oregon. Look at that. They're actually really pretty. <laughs> that would have been a good one to play this game with. Let me show you a key diagnostic feature of the species there. Well, it's hard to see it there. <laughs> this particular light. Let's back it off here. I'll try to show you that it has two little spines there at the tip of its abdomen. Maybe you can see them. Looks like it has a little bit of something stuck to the tip of its abdomen there too, which is making it hard to see the two spines, but there they are. This is Plectrura spinicata. And I think spinny means spined and kata means that terminal end right there and so this is a really neat winter longhorn beetle here in Oregon just moving it very gently you can see my breath there in the air it's quite cold out here but this is the only time of year in the winter months that I ever see this beetle species. Look at those fantastic feet. What a cool looking beetle. Well, maybe we'll uh, 
pop this little guy into our container here and make it a communal container for Elichnia and Plectrura. I might have to go research another bug though. <laughs> they do have a nice little set of mandibles on them. If it had any interest in biting me, it wouldn't be a problem. Oh, very hard bodied. Where did you go? Oh, there you are. Come here. Yep, we'll pop it in there. And keep an eye out for other things as we move up the steps here. Just never know what you're going to see. Oh, Helops. A little Teneb, Tenebrionidae. Family beetle. Wasn't expecting that either. <laughs> See, everyone, this is really the story of my life right here. It's just one bug after another, really is. Did that fall in the cup? This is, this is part of the story of my life. And you saw it earlier in the video too, with the Altica flea beetle that part of the story where I drop something and then have trouble finding it. Well, it may have fallen in the cup. We'll find out later. I will say one other thing. It's very hard for me to get back into the house sometimes. All right. Here's our little firefly from last night. Never really got to see the underside of it there. Quite pretty with that salmon coloration. Seems to be doing very well. You can see that it doesn't have any pale segments there towards the tip of its abdomen here. If this were a species that were capable of bioluminescing or glowing in the dark, as people often say, it would have a sort of a pale yellowish green segment or two there where it's all black in this species. So I'm going to pop it in there including the moss to this container that we just made for it. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to wet the substrate down here in the bottom of the container just a little bit. It's very wet here in my area of Oregon. And there's our beetle right there. It's very wet here and very humid. All the rain we have, the water on the ground, just doesn't really evaporate at this time of year. Now these are capable of flying and it might be warming up here rather quickly. There, a look at the wings as it flips itself over. Much better close-ups than we got last night. The species out there where we found it. Well, let's pop it in its new home and I've got a jelly here I'm going to open this up and put a portion of it a very small portion 
Don't want the beetle getting stuck in it. This is a cap from a water jug. I like to use these. It keeps the jelly off of the substrate. It prevents it from molding or being absorbed by the substrate. And then I've also got a little fish food pellet, a little bit of protein that I'm going to put also in that cap after I kind of pulverize it a little bit. I'm going to put the tiniest little drop of water there as well. See our beetle is making its escape here. And I'm going to place this down here onto the substrate. Put our beetle friend back down there. And in fact, I'm going to put it right there near the food to see if we can't get an immediate response to the food. I'm going to attempt to redirect it there again. And it's going off to the other direction there a little bit. However, it is immediately feeding on some of the liquefied fish food pellet. And I don't think that's because it was thirsty. It's all the moisture that's starting to evaporate from the collecting vial. There's plenty moist in there. There's no reason why this beetle would be thirsty. And so I think that it's seeking nourishment there in the food that we've provided to it. What are you doing, Plectorura? So, so far so good. Now, this would, it would be important for me to mention that um, both of these beetles were outdoors. And while it's normal for the, them both to be out there this time of year, bringing them indoors here where it's warm, potentially disrupts their life cycle. And where they may have not had much of an interest in feeding while they were sort of maybe resting out there through the colder winter months, overwintering, bringing them in here where it's warm changes things. And where a lot of beetles might not feed during the winter months because there's no food for them out there. In the same way there will be in spring when the flowers bloom Bringing them indoors can cause them to develop an interest in food and feeding. And so I'm sort of torn as to whether I should keep this container down in a different room that I don't keep heated, or if I should leave them here with food in this warmer room indoors. So I think I'm going to keep them in here for at least a few days and make some observations. But this mostly concludes this video. I had 24 hours and I put this all together for you guys in 24 hours. So it was a great suggestion and a lot of fun and feel free to ask for updates on them down the road. I don't see that Helops to Neb beetle in here, so it must not have fallen into the cup. Thanks for watching, everyone. Hit the like button, and please feel free to ask any questions about this or anything else. Thank you. Actually, there was one thing that I forgot to do in demonstrating this to you now. I might ordinarily use a typical polyfiber fruit fly culture lid for a 32 ounce deli cup like this. And by that I mean a lid like this, one of these more standard fruit fly containers. That one had a mantis in it, by the way. But humidity is important for this species. It said they like moisture in some of the reading that we did. And so. I'm just going to poke a few pinholes in here. There's a lot of airspace in this container. There's also a lot of humidity in there right now. 
see that. Some of that will evaporate through this lid. I'm going to make some observations about how quickly it evaporates. I don't think it's going to evaporate too quickly, but I also don't want the air to stagnate in there too much. And so over the course of the first few days when you set a new container of something up, make observations about what's going on in there. If you start to see mold, you might punch more holes in or change out a different kind of lid. Sometimes, as in the case of this container right here, I actually put two kinds of lids on. And so I have a Mantis egg case in here. And so sometimes for part of the day, I leave this breathable lid in place without this. And sometimes when I feel like I need to increase the humidity, I put this lid on top, or I might offset it a little bit. Just kind of depends. And all of these things are based on experience. Now I just sprayed this container probably 45 minutes ago and put this lid on to really humidify this egg case. But now it's time for me to pull that off and let that moisture on the side evaporate because I don't want mold growing in there. Lots of little tri tricks and tweaks and I make, may make some changes to this yet as time goes on as I observe how all of these various variables are interacting with each other. And that's it. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up and please subscribe and hit the little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching.